Working on CRTs can be dangerous and if not lethal. You should not attempt to open up or fix any CRT without having good understanding of safety precautions. I am not responsible for any harm or damage done to anyone or anything. After all, this video is just a visual diary of my progress. And finally, if you have epilepsy or photosensitivity, I do not recommend you watch this video. In my previous video, I modified a Blowpunk CRT so that I could switch from RGB to composite when using a G-SCART switcher. My friends are also my biggest critics, and DJ Cal, a respected CRT enthusiast and modder who's better known for his reproduction Lerva VGA card, was heartbroken seeing me drill into the side of my CRT. So in DJ Cal's honour, I needed to redeem myself for my next CRT by using a no-cut mod. No-cut mods are the gold standard in today's retro gaming community because older mods meant cutting permanent holes out of the console to make way for switches and video ports. But once these modifications were superseded by better products and installs, we were left with consoles looking like Swiss cheese from obsolete and outdated mods. And just to be clear, I'm not necessarily doing a no-cut mod on a CRT because I have future mods in mind. I mean, I evidently don't have any issue with cutting holes into a CRT, but rather this is a challenge for myself and a chance to innovate. The rules for a no-cut mod are simple. Don't cut the plastic casing, you can remove original components in favour of new, and the modification must be reversible. My candidate for this mod came in the form of a Sony KV-14VM5G-AS. It's a 14-inch VCR combo that has composite video and mono audio. I just love these combo units and their perfect marriage of two obsolete technologies. I always use an expendable VHS when testing a VCR, just in case it chews the tape. And it looks like the making of Braveheart will get to live to see another day. Dave from the EEV blog did an RGB mod on the same model Trinitron and his video made my job a lot easier by mapping out the RGB and fast blanking inputs. For this mod to work, there needs to be analog RGB inputs on the video chip, or better known as the jungle chip. An RGB mod can technically be carried out at the neck of the CRT, but you'll lose any adjustments that the jungle chip performs, such as brightness and contrast. And unless it's done to precision, you'll risk having poor clamping and black levels. The on-screen display, or OSD for short, is typically generated by a separate MICOM chip that feeds into the jungle chip's RGB signals. When a button is pressed to bring up the OSD, there's a nominal voltage being sent to the fast blanking pin on the jungle chip to switch into RGB. If you're lucky, the RGB inputs might be unpopulated, which leaves them free to use without needing to mux the RGB signal. This TV has two video chips, and the first chip is buried under the VCR unit, and luckily the second chip was located on this removable board. The amplified RGB output from the jungle chip completely bypasses the second video chip's inputs, and are delivered straight to the pre-driver transistors. And on the second video chip, there's unpopulated RGB inputs that terminate to ground with SMD caps. So these pins are what I'll be tapping into. This also means that the OSD should display when in RGB video mode. The example RGB circuit in the video chip's data sheet shows typical 75 ohm termination followed by a 0.1 microfarad capacitor for AC coupling to filter DC noise. As this chip needs to receive RGB video at peak to peak 700 millivolts, I didn't need to amplify or attenuate the RGB lines because this is what's already output from the retro game console. Fast commutate is the fast blanking pin, and it needs at least one volt to switch into RGB. This set only has a single set of AV inputs on the front, which has me covered for sync and audio, as well as grounds using the shield of the RCA ports. I just needed a port that could carry at least three more signals for red, green and blue. The auxiliary jack looked like the perfect candidate if it was wired with standard left, right and ground connections. However, when I plugged in an auxiliary cable, it proved it wasn't going to be so simple. Pins 1 and 2 respectively were ground and audio, but the third pin was for muting the external speakers by physically disconnecting the right audio pin from the jack, 
which only left me with two signals when inserted. So I measured up a replacement port that would perfectly fit in the space of the old connector. Desoldering the existing port put the TV into a permanent mute state. So I bridged pin 3 to ground to activate the audio circuit for the TV's mono speaker. Next I removed the SMD terminating capacitors along with the pull down resistor on the blanking pin. I ended up putting that resistor back though because removing it introduced a lot of noise to composite video. After the caps were off, I soldered my own 0.1 microfarad ceramic caps to the RGB pins. I found which pins on the 3.5mm jack corresponded to the new port and wired it to the caps on the video chip and SCART socket accordingly. I soldered the composite video and audio RCAs and connected the grounds. And here's the SCART RGB adapter with dual mono audio. And always remember to put the wires through the plastic screw for the SCART head before soldering. Blanking was achieved by applying 5V to pin 21 of the video chip, and I used a touch sensor to make this a switchless mod. These are nifty little sensors that have different states depending on which jumpers are bridged. I closed the B jumper pad with a solder blob to make the sensor constantly output whatever voltage was supplied to the VCC pin. These sensors don't like much current though, and at 5V they can overheat and shut themselves off. I used a 20k pot, and at around 13 kilo ohm, the blanking voltage dropped to sub 2 volt. This was the ideal voltage, and any lower meant that the touch sensor wouldn't power on. I hot glued the wheel so that the resistance wouldn't be altered, and adhered the switch to the inside of the TV. I marked the sensor with a sharpie so I could use a sticker to know where to touch for RGB. This is the result of my switchless, no cut RGB mod where apart from the headphone jack being replaced and the sticker, it looks and functions as it did from the factory. And plugging in the SCART breakout adapter for RGB, sync and audio, I now have a fully capable RGB monitor. RGB switching with the touch sensor is so satisfying and seamless, and I was constantly switching back and forth. And oh, you better believe I'm gonna show Sonic's waterfall in composite video. RGB modding is like taking off makeup to show the true imperfections in the tube. With better clarity, I saw that convergence really needed some work. Adjusting purity and convergence on a CRT is like a never-ending game of tug-of-war. Each of the rings around the neck of the CRT adjust the magnetism and direction of the electron beams. You spin the rings or pairs of rings around to try and align the RGB phosphors as close as possible on the X and Y axis while alternating through different convergence test patterns in the 240p test suite. I find it's best to prioritise the convergence in the centre of the screen because the corners can be fixed later. This can also be a dangerous process. So like I always say, this is not a tutorial. I was finally happy with the centre of my screen. So I grabbed a few convergence strip magnets that I scrapped from broken sets and slipped them under the yoke. Then it's a matter of moving the strip in and out until the RGB lines are straight and uniform as possible. Then stick them down with some pre-cut tape. I used four strips in total, and even though blue is still a little out in the corners, I'm pretty happy overall with the convergence. I have an RGB modded sharp VCI combo so you can see the difference in the curvature as shadow mask tubes are curved both horizontally and vertically. I do slightly prefer the look of the Trinitron, and this one is overall sharper and colours are a little more vibrant. Both of these combo units have the same jump in sync whenever there's a major transition in screens in both composite and RGB, so it's got nothing to do with them being modified. If anyone can shed any light on why it's happening on two VCR combos from different brands, I'd be interested to know. I've been fortunate to have several different PVMs come and go over the years, so I've seen a wide range of TV line counts, and I know high TV line tubes when I see one, and this set does not come close to a PVM. Don't get me wrong, the picture is still really nice, but scan lines just aren't pronounced with a low TV line tube. Let's compare to a PVM 14L5 with 800 TV lines, which for a 14 inch tube is razor sharp. 
800 TV lines means that there's 800 distinguishable red, green and blue phosphors running at a horizontal width that's equal to the height of the monitor. I know there's test patterns for these kinds of things, but I want to try something different, so hear me out. I'm going to solve for x because we know that the TV line count on the PVM is 800. So theoretically, I can use an identical image to calculate the line count for the consumer Trinitron. With Mario against a black background and in the middle of the screen where convergence should be optimal, I count 39 red phosphors in the second line of Mario's hat on the 14L5. And on the VCR combo, I see about 19 lines. So if we simply divide 19 by 39 to give a factor of 49%, we can estimate the consumer set to have approximately 390 TV lines. All in all, this was a fun mod, and it was a chance to innovate and redeem some respect from the no-cut crew. I don't think that a no-cut method is necessarily the way to go for a CRT, because you need to make a separate dongle for the SCART port. And if that's ever damaged or lost, well, you'll have to remember the pinout and how it was wired. But having a touch sensor to toggle functions is definitely something I'll look at doing again in the future. Thanks all for watching, and happy gaming.